Now, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, and then we'll look at 2 Peter, or 1 Peter, chapter 3. We're going to look at 1 Peter 3 and 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. 1 Peter 3 and 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. The sign how you can tell what a true church is throughout history and today is to see if it is anti-Catholic. Now, the biggest sign of an anti-Catholic church was through baptism. That's why this is known as anti-Catholic slash Baptist. That's why we proudly call ourselves Baptists. You might say, why is that? Because going tracing further back through the Baptist tra tradition, where you go to Anabaptists, for example, and other people who made a big deal about baptism, Baptists made a big deal concerning water baptism. Why? Because the, the Catholic Church made a big deal about water baptism. The first sign that is so important in the sacraments and the face of Catholicism, what you have to start out with is baptism. That's key. Why? Because baptism is a sign. Baptism is a sign of your allegiance. So the Roman Catholic Church... They made a big deal about baptizing people into the faith. Why is that? Uh, especially pagans. Constantine uh, sprinkled all his soldiers and called them all Christians automatically. Like that made him a Christian. You might say, why is that? Because it's a sign that you're now a part of our church, a Catholic church. That, why? Because Jesus said that baptism is a sign that you're a saved believer. It's a sign you're a saved believer. So the Catholic Church took that as a sign of a true believer is their baptism. That's how you can tell in church history who's the right group of people. Look at their baptisms. In their baptisms, the Catholic Church heavily criticized these people. Why? Because some of them, if they were baptized into the Catholic Church and they were lost, they believed in rebaptizing these people. Why? Because that Catholic baptism did not count. That was a clear sign you are not part of the Catholic Church. That's why baptism was extremely important. It goes all the way back where we go from Donatist to Novatians. Then we go down to the Cathari, and then we also go to the Albigenses and Waldensians, and then the Vaudois. So these people are the most ancient that time, who through their baptisms, the Catholic Church dubbed them as heretics. So Baptists, we go all the way back, all the way from the true believers, how they did baptism. Why? Because we don't count. One is that we don't believe baptism for salvation. The Catholic Church did. Catholic Church believed in baptism for salvation. So then if you were part of, so think about this. If you're, if you're right now part of the Catholic Church and you got baptized for your salvation, and then later on you got saved in Jesus Christ, you know what that means? Your previous baptism didn't count. You have to get baptized again. That's a sign of anti-Catholicism. That's a sign you're a Baptist then. So look at 1 Corinthians 1.17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So notice over here, the salvation gospel is not part of baptism. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Oh, see, baptism saves us. Ah, look at the next part. Not the what? Putting away of the filth of the flesh. Baptism doesn't save you from your sins. It's not salvation from your sins because it doesn't put away the filth of your flesh. For some people who are still skeptical, look up filth of the flesh at 2 Corinthians 7, 1. That's referring to your sinful nature. So we don't believe in a doctrine called baptismal regeneration. That's heresy. Amen. Where you get regenerated and saved by baptism. That's heresy. It says it doesn't do that. Baptism saves us what? The answer of a good conscience toward God. Yeah. It, if you have a good conscience, you're going to get baptized again after you get saved. You're going to get a good conscience. Why? If you were a former Catholic, this is a sign I renounced the Catholic Church. Yeah. My previous baptism didn't count. That's why anti-Catholicism and Baptists go hand in hand. Look at Acts chapter 8. This is, this is the best verse to prove Baptist doctrine. 
So they didn't have the name Baptist necessarily, but that ideology was ever set in foundation in stone in scripture. Donatists, Novations, etc., etc. A lot of these people may have the specifics of baptism wrong. You can find doctrinally wrong. However, what you can get right out of them is this, is that it's a sign of renouncing Catholicism, what they want a true believer to be. It's through rebaptism. Look at Acts chapter 8. Look at this. This is extremely important that modern Bible versions take out. If they took this out, you would have gotten rid of one of the most important verses on this sixth point. Look at verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You have to be a saved believer in Jesus Christ, a true believer in Jesus Christ first, then you get baptized as a sign showing it. Verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a sign of a true believer. It's a sign of an anti-Catholic person. Amen. That's why verse 38, he got baptized later. Important. One of the best verses on Baptist doctrine. That's a verse proving Baptists go way back at the early centuries. All right. Uh, let's go to the seventh point. Can someone shout out the seventh point to me? It's worldly. All right, so the next point is anti-worldly. We're not only anti-Catholic, we're also anti-worldly. And that's why we're also dubbed as fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. We don't go by the grain of the world. We don't follow the world. That's why they call us fundamentalists. But if you look at fundamentalist, it doesn't mean a terrorist. It actually simply means one who follows the fundamentals of the faith. Look at John chapter 17. John 17. A church that follows with the trend of the world is not a true New Testament church. So why do they have contemporary music then, huh? That's worldly music. That was birthed out of Hollywood. That was birthed out of famous musicians who got heavily involved in Hollywood. Hollywood is the clear sign of worldliness that you can get. Any Christian that becomes a Hollywood church, you're not right with God. Look at John chapter 17. Calvary Chapel with their uh, hippie movement, their worldly dressing. Hip song with their, with their worldly music. Anything that mix, mingles with the world is not a true New Testament church. Getting involved in politics is not a sign of a true New Testament church. Because even the Republican conservative fo party follows the trend of the world. Sure, you can find principles that you can say is Christian or you can match with the Bible that you can agree with. Politics, believe it or not, are some uh, political ideology is not birthed out unless there are some people who have a belief down here. So yes, we can see that. But you got to realize this, that when you, when you go by specific parties, they contaminate your beliefs. Yes. They are influenced by your beliefs, but they also contaminate it at the same time because it's not your personal belief. It's the party's personal right, belief. Right. John chapter 17, verse 16. They are what? Not of the world. Even as what? I am not of the world. But uh, aren't we in the world? Yeah, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Because look at this. Verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the what? World. Look at these Christian churches praying for the world. Praying for the world. No, God says don't pray for the world. Right. Why? Because they're evil. They hate Jesus Christ. Right. Even people with good intentions, they do not love Jesus Christ. Verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So notice over here that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. That's why they call you fundamentalists. See that? You see these wicked, evil Calvinists and charismatics, non-denominational churches who attack fundamentalist churches? Why? Because they're too legalistic. They get rid of the love of Jesus. They don't have a love for others and souls, etc., etc. These are wicked, evil people. They're of the world. Those are the type of people who will condone worldly music, worldly dressing, and politics. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's look at the eighth point. What's the eighth point? Anti-intellectual. Anti Go to the book of Colossians. Colossians. We're going to look at the book of Colossians. The trend of Bible believers, the right Testament church, is that they go against the world's main education system. Did you hear what I just said? I didn't say true education, true intellectualism, true academics, true science, true philosophy, etc., etc. Look, all this stuff, they got some good teachings and you should study it even more, but mainly, if you go by the world system of doing things, it's corrupted. Look at the world system of psychology, uh, philosophy, higher education, higher academics. When a church tries to adopt that into its system, listen up now, we're a Bible institute, but they want to get more academics inside. Look, there's nothing wrong with that. I wish that Christians would get more uh, highly educated. We should do that with our young people so that they don't get brainwashed by the wicked world. But look at the trend because they want to be more respectable in academics. They're going to tend to compromise more. And that's where you have to keep a red light on. Look at all these fundamentalist Bible colleges. I'm talking about fundamentalists too. Fundamentalist Bible colleges who adopted academics. Bob Jones University uh, fell away a long time ago. You, Bob Jones Sr. was known as a, one of the big fundamentalist guys. Then his children got more involved in academics, fell down. Yeah. Look at Liberty University. Didn't yeah. you know Jerry Falwell, the founder of it? He used to be fundamentalist too. But what happened? Compromised with the world and then got involved in uh, intellectualism, fell down the drain. Look at big shot Bible schools who started out good. By the way, didn't you know that Berkeley and Harvard started out, and Princeton started out as good schools too? Jonathan Edwards' son-in-law started Princeton. Whoa! How about that? But guess what? The, the, once they uh, the mainstream world kept digging deeper into academics, and guess what? It became more wicked. How about that? Harvard University had George Whitfield preach for them. Can you believe that? Berkeley, their phrase, let there be light, founded, I think, uh, if my memory serves me right, Methodist, but their name, Berkeley, was actually from one of the most spiritual men you'll ever hear in the Bible. That is a famous quote that you probably heard before at Romans chapter 7 when Dr. Upman comments on it. You know what the guy said? Berkeley, whose name Berkeley University took after? Uh, I think it goes, uh, wait, let me just look at that real quick. Let me, let me quote to you. It's a good quote. It's a good quote, all right? But you know what quote I'm going to read, right, guys? You know that quote. Uh, I can say it roughly, but I, I would do it injustice if I don't do it accurately. So let me read it over here. So I'm sure that he would have that quote. Oh, it looks like he doesn't have that quote. I was hoping Dr. Ruckman would have that quote over here. Nope, he does not have it, so I'll, uh, he does not have it. I just have to say it from the top of my memory. But basically, the saying goes this way, is that uh, uh, when I pray, I sin. Uh, when I serve the Lord, when I read the Bible, I sin, and I sin. Uh, my repentance needs to be repented of, and my tears need washing in the blood of Christ. Wow. That was a famous quote showing the two natures of man where no matter how many spiritual things we do for Jesus Christ, our fleshly nature will still sin at the same time. That's holy thinking right there. My repentance needs to be what? Repented of? I can make a sermon off of that. They'll put everybody on the, on the altar probably. And my tears need what? Washing in the blood of Christ. All right. Uh, I'm, so I can't preach on that, unfortunately. <laughs> That's like the book of Colossians. Chapter 2. That goes a lot. Berkeley, one of the most wicked universities you can think of now. I've taken, uh, took a, is this so ironic, man? Taking one of the most holy statements ever from a man, from his name. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, they will. <laughs> they will. <laughs> Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Yeah, I'm going to have to change all the video titles, you know. Like, Dr. Gene Kim, UC Berkeley. I'm going to just have to scratch that out now. <laughs> All right, let's look at Colossians 2. What did the Bible warn you about philosophy? Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after to the tradition of men, 
after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. That is a sign of a true church's anti-intellectual. Look at church history. All the big shot intellectuals, the early church fathers, messed up and created the monster Catholic church. Created false doctrine. You know who are the ones who are the true believers? The one who are the weirdos. Amen. Unintellectual. The one who were dubbed Donatists, Novatians, Cathari, Vaudois, heretics, weirdos. You want to look at the cults. Look at those guys. They tend to be the right guys. Yeah. Oh, you know, that church, that is, uh, it's anti-intellectual. They have a bunch of members over there who are not smart. They're not well-informed people. Yeah. That's what the government's now doing. Not, right. uh, unintelligent people are the ones who are speaking out against us and speaking out against uh, the liberal movement, etc., etc. It tends to be those people that the Lord uses. Because the Lord started out with fishermen, who the Jewish Sanhedrin, who are highly intellectual and elitist, they said about these disciples, these men are ignorant, are not well learned. Wow. All right. What is the ninth sign? All right. The most important. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 15 and 3, verse 16 through 17. Let's close it off right here. The sign of a true Bible-believing church is when they study and live by the Bible. And that is the problem with independent fundamental Baptist churches. See, they might have fundamentalists and they might have independent, which was from our fourth point, if I recall. But do they have, uh, they might be independent, fundamental, they might be even Baptist to distinguish. But are they Bible believers? That's why we call ourselves real Bible believers. You might say, how so? Because we want to show the world what a real Bible believer is like. It ought to be. And these nine signs are how I want to, our church to live by, and that's how I pastor and attempted to pastor. And that's the only reason why the Lord will bless our church. So if it, so every believer should live by these nine points. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, uh, one of the famous verses, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to study the Bible. That's why, why do people get intrigued by my videos and keep watching? There's so much information because of studying the Bible. So dispensationalism, I never heard that before. The Genesis gap, wow. Differences with kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Eternal security, dispensational salvation, pre-tribulation rapture. Down to the deepest doctrines. We talk about even blue-blooded aliens, the shape of the universe, the sea of glass, and etc. Wow, fascinating. Why? We study the Bible so we can get deeper into truth. That's the problem with today's IFB churches, independent fundamental Baptist churches. They don't study the Bible. If you don't study the Bible, then what happens is these eight points that you, your independent fundamental Baptist churches started out with is going to fall. Right. Did you pay attention to what I exactly said? And you Bible believers better listen up too. Is that if you, if you fail to study the Bible... These eight points, I don't care if you get these eight points right. You start out with eight points, but when you fail to study the Bible, you will die out or your next generations will die out. It is so important to study the Bible yeah, and not just study. You need to live by the Bible. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture given by inspiration of God, profitable doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Verse 17 that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto what? All good works. It's one thing to study the Bible, but guess what? If you stop there, guess what? These eight, this, if you go from eight points to nine and a half, you die. Your church will fall apostate. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? The important thing is when you go by the eight points to nine and a half, you need to live by the Bible. That's good. So when you studied it, are you going to live by it? How is it applicable where you can live it? Didn't you know even blue-blooded uh, UFOs from outer space, you can live by that? Even if you study a deep doctrine like that, a crazy doctrine, you might say, no, that's weird. No, I'll tell you. 
what it helped me out with. Because I, uh, at the beginning, I was skeptical, sure. But then when I studied in the Bible more, it made me believe it. The specifics of UFO, well, I couldn't really believe. I wasn't sure. In time, I started to believe the specifics more. But the thing is this. When I started to believe in something really crazy and deep like that, it made me careful of our wicked government around our world. That's how I live by. Why do you think the Lord blessed me with the Bible-believing church and one of the most liberal communities? You thought about that? See, it became lived by. Why? Because I, know, because I started to believe, and if not believe some specific, specifics, at least be open-minded to some specifics, the government may be capable of doing this. Why do you think our YouTube videos are still running? See, because they may be capable of what? Tracking and doing this. You never thought of that before, did you? You can live something deep. The Genesis gap. Well, why is something deep like that can be important? Because I can live by it. Why? Satan really hates us. It makes me understand Satan's kingdom because we took it over if we believe Satan had a kingdom previously uh, before the creation of Adam and Eve. If I believe that, then I am aware, man, Satan really hates us, so it makes me more spiritual warfare uh, watchful. That's what happens. How about that? Dispensationalism? Whoo! Definitely live by. Because that's the majority, 90% of wrong doctrine in our world. So, Bible believers, they study, but they don't live. That is your problem. You study, but you don't live. Because you get into the meat studies, but what about the milk studies, right? The Bible shows that you, uh, meat... At the book of Hebrews, you can know a lot of meat, but you lack grace. And, that, and by violating living by the Bible, you violate, if I recall, the fifth point, unity of the body of believers. Because in every history, and even today amongst Bible-believing churches, everyone is different. And they don't all agree in the same thing. Oh, people online think I'm over-divisive and arrogant. And then some... Uh, some pastors uh, around the world, excuse me, some Bible believers online think I'm divisive and arrogant, and other Bible believers online think that I'm compromising. What in the world? You know what? They're, they're so both off balance. You know why? Because they didn't find the right group of people, the right church movement. They all have their own independent beliefs and pick and choose which one is uh, you're being arrogant and picking and choosing which one is you're compromising. Then you're your own cult. If you don't want to be a cult, you need to follow how God moved among the church throughout history. And these are the nine pointers. That's how I live my life balanced at that. So if you think that I'm too extremist for kicking certain preachers, and if you think that I'm, too, that I'm compromising with this government and this world, you guys can go take a hike. And go jump in a lake and hopefully the Lord can wash some sense into you where you can see these nine pointers. All right, please. This is so important to live by, especially onliners, because you're prey to anything you watch and creating your own cult, creating your own beliefs. You need to look at the nine pointers and then find the right church that followed these nine pointers. And then you're going to find out. That's why we started our channel, Real Bible Believers. That's why we try to put Bible-believing preachers in the website and recommend you their churches. That's why we try to recommend Bible-believing websites. We tried to do that. That's why we have different Bible-believing preachers in our blowout revival meetings. You know why? We want to show that world this is the right church you want to get involved with, Amen. this church movement. Amen. Join the proud group of Real Bible Believers. You know what? I'll put the compilation video at the end of this Amen. showing that we're a team and we're against Satan's system. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, made us very, very motivated and careful and aware and serious about being a true Bible-believing church. What is our purpose for being here? What's the purpose of running this church? May we now be well aware. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.